Hello, this is Nicolai Mandel from Target HIV, and welcome to this session, which will be a uh, rapid fire roundup of some effective care interventions developed by Versa Have TA providers. Uh, here's our agenda for today. I'll give you a brief tour of the Target HIV website if you're not familiar with it or if you need a refresher. And then we will have um, 10 minute or so presentations from six different uh, developers of um, TA projects that were developed for the Ryan White community. Okay, first we'll talk about Target HIV. Target HIV is the central home for all TA projects um, and products developed uh, by and for HRSA's Ryan White HIV AIDS program. So it's your one-stop shop. This is what the homepage looks like. Um, we have a uh, focus area each month, but then we have news, a news feed, a calendar of webinars and other events, uh, an extensive library with several hundred resources developed for Ryan White agencies and other HIV AIDS care providers, a community section where we have um, ways to connect with other people and uh, resources for people in your role, and then um, a way to request help, including our directory of technical assistance providers. Uh, as of this recording, this is a um, some of the bigger technical assistance projects that whose products are featured on the site, and you may be familiar with one or more of them. Uh, this is from our homepage footer, so if you're ever looking for an agency, you just go to the homepage and scroll down. And then in addition to the technical assistance uh, projects, we have what we call innovation projects, which are ones that are studying and, um, and uh, perfecting uh, new and innovative approaches for providing uh, HIV care. And these projects are also listed in the footer. So Target HIV is the place to go if you need to figure out kind of how to do something you're required to do. And a major example is how to file your data report. You've got all the manuals, the guidelines, and um, links to policy clarification notices. So, um, so answers to specific questions. If you, um, if you want to mix it up in your agency, do something a little different. We've got lots of places for you to kind of get inspiration uh, from replication packages for kind of proven effective interventions to blog stories that kind of highlight what one or two agencies are doing case studies, uh, there are a lot of places to kind of get inspired, just like this conference. And then finally, we've got our, kind of our library of uh, resources. So news items, um, documents, uh, uh, directories of not only grant recipients, but also TA providers, funding announcements. So uh, come check it out. And here's some things you can do on Target today. You can set up your own account. Um, you can sign up for email newsletters from many of the TA providers and get kind of targeted updates on topics of interest, um, catch up on news and what's coming up on the, the training and TA calendar, and just kind of look in the library and see if there's anything that can help your program. And this is how to get in touch with me. Uh, you can also, there's a contact form on the site that you know, our whole team has access to. So please reach out if you have questions. And now we will move on to our presentations uh, from the TA programs. Thank you. Thank you, Nicolay. I think I'm first. So I'm gonna uh, start sharing my screen. I think you need to stop sharing yours, wonderful. While I'm pulling this up, I first of all, a, a welcome and thank you so much for joining our session today. I know you have many other options to go to. Uh, my task for the next 10 minutes is to tell you a little bit about the CQII, the Center for Quality Improvement Innovation and its offerings. 
Um, we have an extensive resources available. We are a single entity to help you, the Rhine Wright recipients and sub-recipients for quality management. So here's a quick overview. Um, we just have been refunded. So for the next four years, we are the center to help you to meet the expectations for the clinical quality management expectation that HAB has set out for you. You see on the slide the, the mission statement that we have. We are a catalyst. Um, we can help you, um, not only the recipients, but also sub-recipients um, for advancing and improving HIV care with the hope that we make a difference in the communities that you serve. So we provide a myriad of different options for technical assistance, and this slide summarizes some of our offerings. Our starting on the lower left of getting information out regarding quality improvement, um, I will share with you a little bit our online presence on the Target HIV site. Um, we also have uh, developed lots of guides that hopefully have been helpful um, to you and the provider and consumers to really advance HIV care. We provide not only um, in-person trainings, obviously they will, uh, but why we have to wait till 2021 to continue our face-to-face uh, -face training sessions. But we also have lots of um, virtual um, on-demand offerings, such as our TA call, which occur monthly, as well as our online tutorials. We've developed over 35 tutorials. It's probably one of the most accessed resources we have out there. Over 35,000 tutorials have been taken so far. For those that need a little bit more individualized and targeted technical assistance, we're providing on offsite technical assistance. We have a pool of nationally recognized um, QI experts available to you. And um, I'll talk a little bit about the process in a little bit further detail. And lastly, the, probably the most um, technical assistance intensive activity are our national collaboratives, um, something that we have done in the past and will continue to do so where we bring uh, providers together across a wide range of funding streams from A, B, C, D to really um, reach the goal that we have set for ourselves. The next slide um, I want to go through, the next series of slides, is about our key offerings. And the first one I just want to start out, where can you find us? Um, as mentioned earlier, we're at the Target HIV site. Um, probably the best way to do so is by going to any web browser and put in CQII, the Center for Quality Improvement and Innovation. So CQII.org, and it will redirect you um, to the Target HIV site. Um, you, there you can learn about our various um, resources. You can learn a little bit more about um, all kinds of different services that we have available to you, um, including the request for TA. You can also get our latest recordings from our TA webinars and also resources that we recently generated from our anti-sparity collaborative. So this is a little bit the starting point for your efforts to explore more resources around quality improvement. I mentioned earlier that on, and more likely off um, site technical assistance for now is being available to you. So if, if you really um, want to address one and you got stuck in a certain area, we're here to help you. Um, an online TA request form it can you can access it? You can enter the information that's needed. That form that gets uh, forwarded to the HIV spur for their review and approval, and um, and then obviously allocate the appropriate resources to meet the goals um, that you have set. Um, usually there is an orientation call, and we discuss the T objectives to be sure we have the same understanding how and when we can best help you. The Quality Academy is a, our online training offering. Um, it's an asynchronous learning opportunity. There are um, our 40 tutor interactive tutorials. They're usually about 15 minutes long. They target one specific area. And they, we have it in, available in English and Spanish. And we really hope um, that you take uh, advantage of this offering. They're not only for providers, those that may be working in a medical field, but they're also there for um, case managers, and as well as for consumer. We actually have a consumer track where we highlight consumers in quality, where tutorials have been specifically written for consumers. 
Then we also have technical assistance calls. Um, those, as mentioned earlier, they all occur monthly. They are about 60 minutes in length, and we usually bring together uh, a content expert on an identified area, as well as a, some uh, recipients that, that uh, hopefully mirror you and your experiences to really showcase their emerging practices. And there's usually lots of time for exchange, question and answer to really make this uh, a, a hopeful um, resource for you. Lastly, I think it's be sure that you can also check on our resources as it relates to the slide presentation, handouts, webinar recordings. Again, they're all available at cqii.org. We offer uh, many advanced training programs. So the three mentioned here are in-person advanced trainings. We probably have to hold off um, for this year, so we'll probably reconvene uh, next year in 2021. So we have a trainer trainer program. All the three programs are three days in length. They are pretty rigorous, um, but I think it gives you the opportunity to come together with other peers um, around the Ryan Wright community and really learn from others. Often quality managers are the only person that has that same title. So sometimes there's a certain uh, feeling, sense of being isolated and these trainings provide an opportunity to connect with others. I mentioned the TOT. We also have a training targeting quality leaders as well as for coaches, meaning those that work in a network setting and there's one manager for a quality manager for a uh, multiple uh, network of sites. And so they can uh, learn the skill sets to really guide others on their quality improvement journey. We also offer um, opportunities for uh, people with HIV. We believe very strongly that there are key partners in improving the and advanced HIV care. In order to build the capacity around quality improvement, we will offer um, and have offered lots of trainings. Um, we will have uh, at least four annual webinars. We we'll also hopefully have uh, training opportunities coming up as well. To really recognize the, the hard work of many out in the field, um, we started our quality award program to really recognize nationally those that make amazing progress. And so we usually come up with main categories each year. Um, here are a few examples mentioned. And then um, there is a panel that we put together, not only from CQII, but also with HRSA, to really be sure that we um, recognize and award those that really have a story to tell. And then in subsequent TA calls, as well as um, other opportunities to really put light on them. There are profiles on um, the target center from past winners as well. Here is one offering that we will offer in the near future. Um, we have a learning lab that's an upcoming resource. Um, I think COVID told us that we need to really think more about virtual training opportunities. And so over the next couple of months, we will develop at uh, three learning labs. One will be Quality Improvement 101, Advanced Quality Improvement, and people with HIV and QI. And the idea really behind is to have a three month course where the focus is not only on learning about quality improvement, but actually applying it. So though, uh, we hope that you, once the information comes out, that you will join us in any of those upcoming training opportunities. And also I wanna point out quickly that we have an upcoming um, quality improvement collaborative. Um, you see here a picture of our last collaborative that successfully was concluded in December of 2019. And our next collaborative will focus on social determinants of health, specifically focusing on housing, mental health and substance use. And I hope you can join us and to really create a national momentum for change on social determinants of health. Here's just a uh, a picture of many of the resources that are available. Um, many of them are available um, at the target center in terms of PDF. A few of those are actually also available in hard copies. So if you send us an email, we're happy to look up in our storage and send you some uh, guides that are available in hard copy. So there's lots of resources out there. So my last slide is just to uh, give you um, here the contact information. We are happy to help you. We're here and we are resources for you and your efforts not only to meet the clinical quality management expectation set by HRSA HIV AIDS Bureau, but also to help you to advance and allow all patients to get the high quality of care they deserve. 
with that, I'm going to stop my presentation and turn it over back to Nicolay. Hello, everybody, and thank you. Um, I am John Nelson. I am um, the program director of the AIDS Education and Training Center National Coordinating Resource Center, um, the resource center for the AETC program, and I'm also the PI on a current SPENS project um, of integrating routine STI screening, testing, and treatment in um, primary HIV care within the Ryan White program. So today I'm going to share with you um, a couple of projects that um, have we have worked on a, a within the AATC program, the HIV HCV co-infection project that um, started several years ago um, and worked with Part A and Part B sites um, and their regional a AIDS education and training center um, team to increase the treatment and cure of HCV among um, people of color living with HIV and HCV co-infection in um, five different um, jurisdictions um, of, or, or cities or states in the United States. So currently, roughly um, 300,000 people, about 25% of the people living with HIV in the United States um, are co-infected with HCV. Um, and of those in the United States with HIV, HCV co-infection, black and or poor um, clients are significantly less likely to be cured of HCV. And we want desperately to reverse those findings. To address the disparities in HCV prevalence, treatment and cure among people of color with HIV, um, this collaborative was initiated in 2016 as a SPENS project. And, um, and there were um, three Part A and two Part B sites selected, um, along with their regional ATCs and the AIDS Education Training Center National Coordinating Research Center that were asked to help with um, development of resources to help with the training of healthcare providers um, and to hopefully foster changes in patient care um, to increase the cure rate of um, people of color um, being screened and treated if infected with HCV um, and cured. The, um, there were two additional sites added in 2017 um, that are um, that were at part um, C funded sites um, and specifically looked at um, integrating um, substance use care um, with the treatment of HCV and HIV. Um, with the first year, the uh, National, the AIDS Education Training Center, National Coordinating Resource Center, worked with the regional AATCs involved with these Part A and Part B um, and Part C sites. And um, we developed a national online self-directed curriculum. Um, and that has been online um, and free with um, continuing education credits available on the AIDS ETC um, dot org, the NCRC's website um, since 2017. These are contributors and I just want to quickly say thank you to all of them um, and you may know some of them. Um, in addition, after the curriculum was, was started to help providers um, get on board, um, we developed different awareness um, supplies and um, educational um, resources that the regional ATCs used when they were doing capacity building, technical assistance, and training with healthcare providers in each of their regions. Um, these are a list of the things, some of the things um, such as stethoscope buttons, we no longer have any of them, but um, many of these, particularly the educational materials, we still have and we can um, send to you um, if, if you are interested in them. 
and I'll get back to you later on how to how to order those. You can order them from our website. Um, this is an example of one of them. It's it's Hep C screening and treatment, and it just gives the basics on who needs to be screened, what types of tests need to be done, and how frequently the screenings need to be, um, such as with every pregnancy or um, at least once a year. Um, and then treatment guidelines. This is a myth poster. There's been a lot of, um, through the needs assessment um, that was done at the beginning of this project by the, um, the ETAC of, of this SPINS project, the Evaluation Technical Assistance Center, RAND, um, they identified that providers have a lot of resistance to treating um, patients with active substance use disorders. Um, and there's different reasons for that, but this was, um, this is evidence-based findings that negate some of those um, beliefs and attitudes. Um, this was also a card that was developed to give to patients when they complete their treatment and they have a sustained viral response as a result of being on medications for hep C. Um, and we want them to be proud and to also not get reinfected. So this card was developed. This is a card that was developed actually um, because it's it, it, for patients, but it's for the provider to provide education to the patients on which regimens they're on, for how long, what their HIV viral load was, which their HCV viral load was, um, who their pharmacist is, who their, their HIV, hep C providers are, um, so that if they had to go to another provider or to the emergency room, they would have all this. And this folds up into a, a tiny pocket card size um, unit that is discreet and um, allows the patient to always have their, their information on them while they're being treated for HCV. Okay, now to another project that um, is housed, resources are housed on Target HIV, is the Sexually Transmitted Infections um, SPENS project that is um, currently in progress. And what, because STIs have been climbing so rapidly over the last few years, the rates of STIs across this country, um, we wanted to make sure that Ryan White HIV AIDS program providers are using evidence-based recommendations to routinely screen for bacterial STIs, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis in people um, at risk for STIs with HIV. So um, there are, are multiple studies that have been done over the last, several years showing that there are gaps in regular screening. It's time intensive and there are discomforts of clinical care team members in asking sexual health questions and doing routine screenings. Um, and routine screening, I mean not only genital, but extragenital site screenings as well. Um, so according to the CDC Medical Monitoring Project, only 37% of people with HIV reported being tested for gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis in 2017, even though it is a HRSA have performance measure of at least one test per year. Um, and that and the performance measures do not necessarily include extragenital site. Um, this was our needs assessment that was done at the very beginning in 2018 to 2019. Um, and some of the, the we are working with nine clinics, um, three in Louisiana, three in Florida, and three in Washington, DC. Um, of the providers in that clinic, 44% um, reported um, conducting a consistent comprehensive sexual history on intake, and 74% conducted conduct follow-up sexual histories at acute care visits when symptomatic for an STI. So there was, we found that there was a lot of inconsistency in the types of sexual histories that were taken and how often they were taken by different healthcare providers within the same clinic as well as across clinics. Um, STI testing, 67% um, reported um, 
at least an annual basis, 18% um, test for STIs every three to four months among those at greatest risk. And that's what the national recommendations are for. So that 18% should be 100%. Um, we, we developed resources as a result um, of this project to help. One is a comprehensive sexual history template, a pocket guide for clinical tips for routine STI screening, and a pocket guide for syphilis diagnosis and treatment. Um, since syphilis has been a particularly um, virulent um, presentation in most of the Ryan White clinics. Um, these, are, these are things for providers to use in addition to the interventions that were chosen in this project to integrate into routine care. And that's using a computer-based self-reported sexual health history at every visit and um, you, having patients collect their own nucleic acid amplification test specimens for gonorrhea and chlamydia in extragenital sites, as well as their own urine, and, um, and increasing the rates of, you, of, of, of testing people on a more regular basis for those that are at risk for STIs. This is an example that is available on the the Target HIV Center, a comprehensive sexual health history that was developed um, in working with the, um, the, um, the National Network of Prevention Training Centers for STD HIV prevention. They had acknowledged also that there are no um, comprehensive templates available for people just to download and use. So our, our core of on the SPINS project developed this um, and it's available for you to use, take down, um, change however you see best for your pop patient population. Um, this is an STI screening pocket guide that we developed also for as a reminder for clinical team members to um, make sure that screenings are done um, as recommended by the Centers for Disease Control. Um, and lastly, we developed a, a pocket guide and a poster for clinics on syphilis and, and syphilis diagnosis and treatment. Um, these are all available on the Target HIV um, site page for, our, for this particular SPENS project. Um, and I welcome you to reach out with any questions. I will put my contact information in the chat box and thank you so much. And uh, I believe those uh, resources are also available on the AETC NCRC site, if you're more familiar with that. Um, so Allison is our next speaker, and I'll let her introduce herself and uh, unmute herself. Thank you, Nicolay. Um, I'm so um, flattered and honored to, to be here and happy to be here today sharing with you some tools and resources to support the integration of community health workers into HIV care. And before I get started, uh, just a couple words about this project. This was a three-year project um, that started in 2016 that was funded by the uh, Minority um, HIV AIDS Initiative Fund. Um, and um, was administered by the HIV AIDS Bureau in the, the Division of Community HIV and AIDS Programs. And my name is Allison Bachman. Um, I am the, was the project director and I am representing the Center for Innovation and in Social Work and Health at Boston University. Very really happy to talk about this project a little bit. Um, before, oops, trying to, there we go. Before I get into the main resources um, that I want to share um, that we developed as a, a result of this initiative, I, I want to um, also encourage you to um, or let you know you can find some other resources um, on Target HIV affiliated with this project. We did a webinar series, which many of you have already um, taken um, advantage of and, and interacted with. Um, the webinar series, as well as a specific sort of fact sheet, one page fact sheet about the CHW role 
in HIV care teams. Um, community health workers are a long-standing but also emerging workforce in many different kinds of chronic disease, including HIV. And um, they have been shown to be very effective in improving access to care, um, reducing um, the cost of care, and generally improving um, clinical outcomes as well. So they're um, kind of a hot topic. Uh, the three main resources that came out of this initiative that I, I'm really excited to share with you are, uh, number one, an implementation guide for Ryan White um, agencies and HIV um, clinical settings uh, that are interested in either implementing a new community health worker program in their setting or um, agencies that have an existing community health worker program but maybe want some more information or want to engage in some kind of quality improvement process. Um, so the guide might be um, a helpful resource. The second resource is um, a training curricula. Um, as part of this initiative, we um, engaged in um, training community health workers and also training uh, individuals um, who supervise community health workers, which was found to be a really important aspect to a successful community health worker program. So as a result, we, um, we developed um, two training curriculum, uh, one for community health workers and one for their supervisors, and I'll talk about those um, in a, more detail. And finally, um, you know, during this initiative, we realized that access to training um, is not always very easy for folks, um, especially folks who live in rural states. Um, and rural areas are really um, a place where um, HIV is um, prevalent and there are lots of problems with um, disparities around HIV care and outcomes. So we decided to invest some resources into translating parts of the training curriculum into some free self-paced online training. So I'll go through um, that, the elements of those as well. So first, the, the implementation guide. This is really one of the premier resources that we created outside uh, around this initiative. And it really is intended to be a um, complete guide to all different things and all the different topics that um, agencies um, should be thinking about and um, working on in all the different stages of um, developing and implementing community health worker programs. So you can see um, on the slide there, the different um, chapter headings that are in the guide, um, setting up systems, um, how to do recruiting and hiring. Community health workers are a very um, unique workforce. Um, they are bridged from the clinic to the community. Uh, they're not clinical staff. They're not really clerical staff. So it's really, there are special considerations for recruiting and hiring. Um, and often community health workers are hired as much for um, who they are as individuals and their life experience as um, other skills that they might, they might bring um, to the clinic. Um, orientation and training, um, which is also key. Um, the importance of community health worker supervision uh, reflected in a whole chapter about that and what types of supervision um, and, and examples of models of supervision. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is that this guide um, comes with a pretty extensive appendix and we're really proud to share um, specific tools and policies from the field. This initiative worked with 10 different um, Ryan White funded um, provider sites across the country um, and many of them were were uh, very gracious in sharing uh, examples tools and policies everything from job descriptions to home home visit policies and um, performance review um, forms care planning forms um, case conferencing forms so we're really um, thrilled that there are some real world um, tools and policies in the appendix that uh, agencies can use and tailor for their own, their own needs. 
I wanted to provide a little bit of context about how the guide was developed. Um, in 2016, we, we first developed a guide um, for the, the 10 sites that were engaged in this initiative with us. And that guide was developed um, from the literature and also from expert advisors, um, including um, experts in HIV service delivery, peers, and also um, folks who are expert in um, the training of community health workers, as well as community health worker programs, um, both within HIV and in other chronic diseases. And then we um, embarked on um, the implementation process with the 10 project sites and collected information uh, from them throughout on their, on their implementation, um, on the, the policies and procedures they were putting into place, on their challenges and on their lessons learned. And uh, towards the end of the initiative, um, we had a half day activity with all of the project sites where we collected um, really comprehensive feedback from them, um, reflected on the guide that they were given at the start of the project to help them implement their community health worker program. Uh, they gave us incredibly valuable feedback about what the most useful elements of that guide were, um, what was missing, um, what needed to sort of be beefed up and added, and um, gave us a lot of additional resources to include. So you'll see um, on the slide as well, we, um, during that half day activity, we talked about setting up the system of community health worker services. We talked about recruiting, recruiting, hiring, and training, um, what uh, the sites found most useful for integrating the community health worker into the care team, um, the workflow and, and um, what integration looked like in terms of the service delivery model, including outreach and working outside the clinic walls. And then uh, supervision um, was a main topic as well. So you can see there, we collected a lot of notes on a lot of flip chart sheets and integrated all of this into the final implementation guide. So shifting now to the training curriculum that we developed with this initiative, um, the first curriculum is specifically for training community health workers. Um, and this um, curriculum was informed uh, very much by training, um, trainings that are required by states that do offer community health worker certifications. So in this initiative, we really, um, we really wanted to bring together the existing community health worker field um, and the, the um, the field of HIV and particularly the, um, the long history of peers uh, working in HIV. Um, they have a lot, peers and community health workers have um, a lot of things in common. So some states do offer community health worker certification, not all states do at this point, um, but we looked across the states to see what they required and what their CHW certification um, training looked like and decided um, to offer or to develop an 80-hour training curriculum. And this 80-hour training curriculum addresses um, both HIV topics and also core competencies and core skills that community health workers really need to have and uh, knowledge they need to know, uh, regardless of what um, chronic disease or other sorts of um, area they're working in. Our approach to training community health workers was based in adult education and principles of popular education. And you can see the training team um, on the slide there. Our training team consisted of um, experts and uh, professionals with a lot of experience in training around HIV, but also training um, community health workers um, in general. Uh, we had two community health workers who work in HIV, um, participate and develop their skills as part of the training team and also um, trainers um, who are expert in training community health workers. Um, the training curriculum that we have developed um, will uh, be on Target HIV, hopefully when you um, are listening to this uh, presentation, and it will also be available in English and Spanish. Mm -hmm. 
And this slide just sort of shows um, selected um, topics of the, of the HIV part of the training curriculum. There are 16 hours of, um, of training in the curriculum. Everything from, you know, what is the community health worker role on the HIV care continuum, um, CHW's uh, knowledge around medication adherence, comorbidities, um, HIV and aging, uh, sexual health. Um, CHWs often um, talk with clients about their medication regimen and help with medication adherence. So understanding how the life cycle of HIV works and how medications um, in work um, on the HIV life cycle, as well as really Im important um, topics like U equals U and uh, PEP prep and test. And in terms of the CHW core competencies, um, there are sort of um, 10, uh, 11 um, emerging um, consensus around CHW core competencies. And the curriculum covers 64 hours of training around these different core competencies. Um, many of these core competencies, you know, contain individual training modules and many of the training topics um, fall, you know, intersect um, different core competencies. So everything from home visiting to motivational interviewing to documentation in the electronic medical record, professional boundaries and confidentiality, um, et cetera, et cetera. In terms of the CHW curriculum, um, there isn't a lot out there, um, especially for um, CHW supervisors or supervisors in general. Uh, any of you out there who are supervisors um, might uh, relate to this idea of being sort of an accidental supervisor where you, you know, doing your job and you do it really well and then one day you get promoted and suddenly you're supervising people, but you um, haven't necessarily had any specific training on how to be a supervisor. There aren't the same um, sort of consensus roles and skills for people that supervise community health workers, but one of our um, experts and consultants on this initiative um, developed this, um, this table, which became a guide for us. Um, so these are the main roles of CHW supervisors. And so these roles um, influence and inform the skills that they really need to have. So they need to be, you know, administrative um, supervisors, but they also need to be facilitators and mentors um, and advocates for the CHW role in the agency. The training curriculum for CHW supervisors we developed um, is 20 hours of training and really um, covers the topics that you see here. Um, similar topics to CHW training, but also really specific um, topics for community health worker supervisors from you know, types of supervision, trauma-informed supervision, orienting team members to the CHW role, um, the importance of self-care for supervisors, um, and how to recognize um, transference and counter-transference, especially since, since community health workers are often people that, that bring important life spirit experience to the role. They may see themselves in their clients, and the, that is something that they, they need um, support around managing. So finally, um, I want to um, promote the self-paced online training that I mentioned. So um, we, we decided to translate parts of the curriculum into self-paced online training. Um, these trainings will be available on uh, the Center for Innovation and Social Work and Health website, which is listed there on the slide. And I've just highlighted some selected topics for community health workers, um, basic HIV 101, um, highlighting the CHW role in the HIV care continuum, and um, you know, addressing stigma and discrimination with clients, helping clients with that aspect of um, their diagnosis. And um, in addition, um, selected topics for training of supervisors, which I think might even be um, a better vehicle for self-paced online training because supervisors um, tend to be very busy and this way they can sort of uh, get some training on their own time at their own pace. So very similar, to exactly you know, the same topics as the, um, the written curriculum, 
confidentiality and boundaries, trauma-informed supervision, self-care for supervisors, supervisors, different kinds of supervision, and modeling supervision. So um, just to highlight again where you can find all these resources, um, Target HIV, um, I think the best way to try to find them is to just search community health workers on the Target HIV website. Um, and then the other two websites are my organization's website. Um, and you can always reach out to me directly and I'm happy to help you any way I can. Um, thanks again, Nicolay, for inviting me to participate and I'll, um, Stop sharing my screen now. Thank you, Allison. That looks great. Uh, it looks like next in our lineup is Alexis from the Dissemination of Effective Intervention. <laughs> ah, I got it wrong. <laughs> oh, no, it's um, acronyms on acronyms. I understand. I so it's Dissemination of Evidence Informed Interventions Initiative. Kind Very of a mouthful. Good. <laughs> okay, Alexis, I'll let you introduce yourself and get going. Uh, share your screen. Sure. So let me um, first tee up our slides. Um, so my name is Alexis Marbach. I am the Senior Program Manager for the Dissemination of Evidence-Informed Interventions Dissemination and Evaluation Center. So we call ourselves the DEC. Um, so let me just share... Um, PowerPoint presentation, and you all can let me know if you can see this. Nicola, is that working for you all? Okay. Um, so the Dissemination of Evidence-Informed Interventions Initiative is a HRSA SPINS Implementation Science and Replication Initiative. Um, and what that means is it's a first of its kind um, implementation science study where we're looking at uh, replicating four previously implemented interventions that have demonstrated effectiveness in linking and retaining people with HIV into care. So you can see um, on one side of our slide, the four interventions that we had been tasked with uh, replicating. So we had a transitional care coordination intervention, so that was focused on identifying people with HIV in jail, and then making sure that they received services while they were incarcerated and then upon release, so bridging that gap uh, between incarceration and community HIV care. Uh, peer linkage and re-engagement, which looked at um, finding women who had either fallen out of care, who were um, loosely retained in care, or who are, were newly diagnosed. Um, integrating buprenorphine treatment into opioid use disorder, which was integrating buprenorphine, so a form of medication for opioid use disorder, um, into the HIV primary care settings to make more of a one-stop shop model for folks. And then enhanced patient navigation for women of color living with HIV. Um, so the patient navigation was providing um, pretty classic patient navigation services with health education curricula to help women feel empowered to take control of their own health care um, and make sure that they had the tools that they needed to um, stay retained in care. So again, we looked at the four um, interventions that had previously demonstrated effectiveness, and instead of asking, are they effective, we really wanted to learn why and how. Um, so the goal of our work was to study using an implementation science perspective, um, so collecting inf information on the barriers and facilitators to implementation to create these four care and treatment interventions, so we're calling them the KDs. The intervention was a five-year initiative, so 2015 to 2020, um, and it had two cooperative agreements. One was for the ITAC, which was the Implementation Training or the Implementation Technical Assistance Center, um, which was run by AIDS United, and then the DEC team, which I referenced earlier, which was uh, to Boston University and APT Associates. So again, the goal of our um, initiative was to produce the KDs. So um, we're excited to announce that the KDs are starting to be approved by HRSA, um, and you'll be able to see them on the target site. Um, but they are materials to, resport, to support rapid uptake and replication. Um, so, so often you get an implementation manual and you have no idea, like, what are the barriers and facilitators to implementing? How is this going to work in my site? 
Um, how am I actually going to do this work? Um, so the goal of the Katie's is to make it something that you don't need a training and technical assistance center. You don't need an evaluation center. We're giving you all the materials that you need to quickly get going and implement these evidence informed interventions in your community. Um, so you can check out our new Target HIV pages. Um, you can find them at targethiv.org slash DEII. Um, and what you can find there is everything from implementation manuals to um, training manuals. And we're gonna walk through some of the resources that are available um, on the DEII site right now. So the first is the training manuals. And so I just wanna call out AIDS United and their amazing team for creating these training manuals um, in partnership with Impact Marketing. Um, so the training manuals walk through various modules that you need for each intervention. Um, so there's one set for each of the four. Um, it has everything from handouts to PowerPoint slides to flip chart, flip chart sheets um, and reference materials and activities so that when you hire a team of um, peers or patient navigators or clinical coordinators for buprenorphine, you'll have the tools that you need to get everybody trained up and ready to implement. Um, so the next thing we have is our care and treatment interventions implementation manual. So this is the cover of the buprenorphine manual, um, which is almost done, almost ready to be released. Um, and this includes everything from pre-implementation activities um, to intervention implementation activities, um, integration activities, and sustainability activities. Um, we include things like logic models, so hopefully that makes it a little bit easier to secure funding if you're looking to implement. Um, job descriptions for when you're looking to hire team members, um, handouts for clients, and templates for care plans. Um, the care and treatment interventions also integrate the findings that we have from our implementation science study. So you'll see the barriers and facilitators that our sites experience uh, woven into the intervention manual. So hopefully um, it makes it a little bit easier to figure out what some of the roadblocks and some of the successful solutions would be for your site. All right, so another thing that we have um, are site spotlights. So site spotlights are um, highlights of different demonstration sites and things that they did a little bit differently um, that really contributed to success. So um, one thing that you'll see here is one from our transitional care coordination, so that the jails linkage initiative, um, conducting transitional care coordination and challenging physical and community environments. Um, so the Southern Nevada Health District team, they are a team uh, based in Las Vegas. They have a really interesting situation where they have um, a network of tunnels that exist underneath Las Vegas, which are really drainage tunnels for flooding. Um, but what happens is that a lot of folks who are unstably housed upon release end up living in the tunnel system. So what did Southern Nevada Health District have to do um, in order to maintain connections with their clients? Um, you can find all of that and more in things like these site spotlights. Other site spotlights highlighted um, what our team in Puerto Rico did after the hurricane to maintain connection with their clients and make sure that everybody was secured with um, their buprenorphine prescription. Um, you'll also find uh, in information about how the clinical coordinators in the buprenorphine sites uh, maintained connections with both the primary prescribers of buprenorphine and the clients. So intervention fact sheets, um, you'll find these that highlight the intervention summary, um, published literature, theoretical uh, basis for in intervention, staffing requirements. Again, what we're hoping to do here is to make it easier to implement. So if you are kind of wondering like, is enhanced patient navigation right for my site? I'm not sure. Hopefully this will be uh, a resource that you can use to determine whether or not the, the research backs up the case that you're trying to make. Uh, maybe it'll make it easier to write a grant or um, to secure funding. And again, hire the right staff, secure the right resources. Um, so those are the main things that we have to share through the DEII initiative. Um, but on the um, website, the DEII website, you can also find the contact information for myself, Alexis, and my colleague, Hannah Bryant. Um, and Hannah was one of the, the primary team members on the ITAC. Um, and we can send you any materials that you need, and we're happy to talk more and connect you with some of the sites that implemented 
um, so that you can effectively implement in your community. Thank you so much, Alexis. And yeah, this, thank you. New. This project really did set a new bar for um, for replication packages and and really documenting um, in kind of multiple ways uh, for multiple audiences how to uh, implement some of these interventions. So you're doing yourself a favor if you check them out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, thanks so much. And I think our next yeah, speaker thank you. is uh, Holly from HAP, and I'll let her do her own introduction as well. Um, my name is Commander Holly Barella, and I'm a public health analyst. Currently, I'm with the Division of Metropolitan HIV AIDS Programs within the HIV, HIV AIDS Bureau, um, which is a sector of the Health Resources and Services Administration. And I just want to let you know before we get started that HRSA is actually on four social media platforms. Um, we encourage you to follow along and share our content um, on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn and Instagram. Um, and this helps you to stay current on all of HRSA's news. And the HRSA handle for all of these platforms is at HRSA.gov. So ampersand HRSA.gov. You're also encouraged to sign up for HRSA e-news, which is a bi-weekly email, um, and HRSA's press releases. And by accessing more information on programs, please visit www.HRSA.gov. And Thank you for that. So today I'm going to present on um, a project that was funded by HRSA HAB and it's the HRSA HAB Building Futures Supporting Youth Living with uh, HIV and it was a technical assistance um, contract. It initiated as an evaluation contract so we were able to in this project integrate both um, evaluation and technical assistance components. And today we're going to talk a lot about the technical assistance and how, that, how this can be accessed and located. Um, so I'm going to provide a, a quick overview on HRSA. It, Nicole, is there a way to shift these, shift the, or I guess I can move the pictures. I'm just wondering if we can. Yeah, just use the arrows on your keyboard. Um, you should be able to control it. Also down in the lower left, it looks like there are um, arrows. Okay, so what I will do is hide our uh, presentation screen, our pictures, just so that we can see the full slides. Okay, so HRSA supports more than 90 programs that provide health care to people who are geographically isolated, economically or medically vulnerable through grants and cooperative agreements to more than 3,000 awardees. And this includes community and faith-based organizations, colleges and universities, hospitals, states, local and tribal governments, and private entities. And every year, HRSA programs serve tens of millions of people, including people with HIV AIDS, pregnant women, mothers and their families, and those otherwise unable to access quality health care. So that's just an overview of HRSA. Um, HRSA's vision and mission uh, really HAB's vision and mission. Um, you all have seen this before, but you know we can't say it enough because the vision and mission are really embedded in everything we do, um, and particularly this project. So the vision for HAB is optimal HIV AIDS care and treatment for all. Uh, HAB's mission is to provide leadership and resources to assure access to and retention in high quality integrated care and treatment services for vulnerable people with HIV AIDS and their families. Um, the Ryan White program, which is a part of HRSA's HAB, provides a comprehensive system of HIV primary care, medications, and essential support services for low-income people with HIV. More than half of the people diagnosed with HIV in the United States, which is nearly 519,000 people, receive care through the Ryan White HIV AIDS program. Um, the program provides grants to states, cities, counties, and local community-based organizations. And the grant recipients determine service delivery and funding priorities that are based on their local needs and planning processes. Ryan White is always a payer of last resort and that's a statutory provision. So Ryan White program funds cannot be used for services if another state or federal payer is available. 
87.1% of Ryan White HIV AIDS program clients were virally suppressed in 2018, which exceeded the national average of 62.7%. So you can see this is a very effective and robust program. The learning objectives um, for this presentation um, and we believe after this presentation, you'll be able to identify available evidence-informed interventions for reducing disparities in HIV care, to gain insights on managing a successful implementation, and to find training and technical assistance providers and tools on the Target HIV website. And this has probably already been said, but particular for this uh, technical assistance project, we do have materials available on Target HIV. So, in 2016, um, 551 567 clients received services from Ryan White funded providers and approximately 4% of Ryan White clients with HIV were youth and youth is defined as age 13 to 24 years. Um, retention and care was 76.6%. It was much lower than the national Ryan White average at 81.7%. And viral suppression was 71.1%, also much lower than the national average of 84.9%. So given this, um, HRSA have awarded a contract to DS Federal to, to address this. And the purpose of the contract was really to assess the current state of youth with HIV, again, age 13 to 24, receiving Ryan White funded care, and to develop and provide technical assistance to those providers to overcome barriers to care, fill gaps in care, and to optimize health outcomes for the special population. So the HRSA Hab Building Futures Supporting Youth Living with HIV project was funded for a total of three years, which included one base year and two option years. The program began in September 2015, and it ran uh, pretty much through September 2018. So the products, we have a few products that came out of this um, exciting contract, and one was a webinar series. So one thing that we did was conduct um, a HRSA Hab RSR data review. And so out of that data review, site visits were conducted. And so we, we picked about 20 Ryan White funded providers uh, to visit. Some had um, you know, various viral suppression rates. And so we looked at, at these programs across many variables and we chose some programs to visit and kind of figure out you know what are programs with really high viral suppression rates doing well um, and how can we support other programs that don't have as high viral suppression rates so we went out uh, the what we had done was um, built a technical assistance webinar series and a technical assistance toolkit based on findings from interviewing programs so as part of this, the four-part webinar series, it was recorded, um, it's published on the Target HIV website, and the series is organized by following themes. So we found four themes um, in general as part of this, this project. Um, and one is looking at clinical service model models. One is informing program development. Another is infrastructure development and also wraparound services for youth. So those are really the four themes that we honed in on in providing technical assistance and developing the tools. The other product is a technical assistance toolkit. So this is a very large technical assistance toolkit. Um, it includes activities that agencies can undertake to enhance delivery of HIV care to youth with um, HIV. And it also includes insights and examples from the Ryan White funded providers and youth clients that we were able to reach out to and glean information from um, during the project. It is published on Target HIV. And on the web page, if you're going to navigate and look at this toolkit, um, you're going to want to click Access the Building Futures Toolkit and download a PDF version. Um, so online, the toolkit is divided. You are able to access portions of the toolkit that apply to your program um, and, and really glean some good insights from it. And I just want to also say really quickly, um, along with this, we had two provider agencies that presented as part of the webinars and really helped inform the toolkit as well as a lot of youth voice. So. Um, the toolkit is very, very uh, diverse as far as its, its viewpoints and hopefully uh, very suitable. So there's themes we found, about 10 topic areas uh, that are within those four themes. Um, and the first theme 
you know, the clinical service models, as we kind of discussed on the other slide, includes topics such as youth-centered services and interdisciplinary care teams. Theme two for infrastructure development, we were able to design the toolkit to include uh, topics on staff recruitment and retention, improving communication with youth, and LGBTQ friendly policies, environment, and culture. Theme three, the informing program development theme, we were able to gather a couple topics under there, including gathering structured feedback from youth and data-driven programming for youth. And also in the toolkit under theme four for wraparound services, we looked um, at information and we were able to put together some really good tools on youth support groups, uh, another topic identifying and addressing support service needs, and finally the re-engaging youth loss to care. So that's really all uh, I have as far as a really 30,000 foot overview of the toolkit, the webinars, uh, and the products that came out of this contract. And again, you can certainly uh, locate these on Target HIV website. We also have links available in uh, the HRSA Hab Notice of Funding Opportunity Announcements. I mean, you can always reach out to me if you have questions or um, are having any issues or would like more information on uh, gathering the information that we have available. Thank you so much, Commander Maria. And uh, this is, um, this is a really a, a rich resource for people, and it's one of the few ones we have that's specifically focused on youth. So I'm glad you could take the time to uh, highlight it for people, um, and hopefully they'll check it out. Well, you're welcome, Nicole, and thank you for all of your help putting this together. And it's just been a pleasure, um, and we're always available uh, to assist people that need help navigating or understanding any of, of the content. Thank you. All right, thank you. And now we have our next speaker, uh, Mira, from the ACTA Center, which is one of the hot, hot spots on Target um, for the last few years. Thanks, Nicolay, and um, <laughs> hi, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me to talk about the ACTA Center. I am Mira Levinson, the ACTA Center's Principal Investigator and the Co-Director of JSI Center for HIV and Infectious Diseases. So here at the ACTA Center, we build the capacity of Ryan White organizations to navigate the changing healthcare landscape and to help people with HIV access and use health coverage to improve health outcomes. Specifically, we support Ryan White recipients and subrecipients to engage, enroll, and retain clients in Medicare, Medicaid, and individual health insurance options, build organizational health insurance literacy to improve clients' capacity to use the healthcare system, and communicate with clients about how to stay enrolled and how to use coverage. So we do all this by developing and di disseminating best practices and supporting resources and by providing TA and training through both national and localized activities. Our key audiences include program staff, clients, program managers, and administrators across health departments, as well as direct service provider organizations. We also support the people who help enroll Ryan White clients, such as navigators and certified application counselors. So one of the best ways to get to know the ACTA Center is through our webinars. This slide shows a few of our most recent ones. Um, for example, we conducted a webinar on Medicare in April, and in July we conducted a webinar to help everyone get started with preparations for marketplace open enrollment, including remote enrollment strategies. Each of these webinars had more than 500 participants, and in September we'll be conducting our new annual program staff orientation webinar. That one will be on September 3rd, 23rd at 2 p.m. It's designed to introduce people to the ACTA Center for both new staff and staff that might be new to their roles or just new to our work. We're gonna share information there about the life cycle of health coverage and practical strategies and tools to engage, enroll, and retain clients in coverage. We'll focus on private health insurance options as well as Medicare and Medicaid. And we're gonna talk about how the Ryan White program, including ADAP, complements health coverage and supports continuity of care.
Now I'm going to walk through a few of our ACE TA Center resources. These ones uh, on the screen right now are designed for frontline staff like case managers and benefits counselors. You can see here um, a couple of our most popular resources related to marketplace open enrollment. The first one on the left side here is our eligibility decision tree. The eligibility decision tree is designed to help case managers and other frontline staff work with clients to figure out if they are eligible for marketplace coverage or expanded Medicaid. And on the right hand side of the slide, you can see a handout that summarizes the four steps in our account tune ups process. Account tune ups are pre enrollment visits that can be conducted anytime between July and October. And the idea there is to make the actual enrollment process as smooth as possible. In many states, marketplace open enrollment is only 45 days long. So the more you can do in advance, the better. That way there's enough time to get all clients enrolled efficiently starting in November. And we also have an e-learning module on our website that's focused on getting ready for open enrollment that outlines the timeline with key steps programs can take to prepare. For HIV programs that aren't doing their own enrollment, we encourage them to identify and establish partnerships with navigators, certified application counselors, and other enrollment assisters. These assisters may be within a larger organization or health center, or they might be located at a partner organization. Often these folks are really good at enroll enrollment work, but they might need some help learning about what people with HIV need with regard to medication coverage, preferred providers, and the role of the, HIV, the Ryan White HIV program, including ADAP. So this fact sheet covers eight key things that enrollment assisters need to know about working with people living with HIV, including the need to maintain continuous medication coverage, helping clients find a plan that includes their medications and providers, and the role of the Ryan White program, including ADAP. Uh, now here's um, a few examples of our ACE TA Center posters. These posters are designed to spark conversations with clients about getting health coverage and about plan renewals and staying covered. We have three sets of posters. These are just a few examples. Our enrollment posters focus on the benefits of health insurance and help spark conversations about enrollment. Our renewals posters focus on the value of actively comparing plan options each year during open enrollment and on the importance of one-on-one -on -one enrollment support. And finally, our stay covered posters focus on helping clients keep track of paperwork, make sure premiums are paid on time, and also manage gaps in coverage. Some of our ACE TA centers uh, resources are designed especially to share with clients. So a case manager or enrollment assister can go over these tools while sitting with a client or can give them to a client to take home. Here are a couple of examples. The one on the left is called Get Covered for Healthy Life. It's designed to help eligible clients who have not yet enrolled in health insurance. The Get Covered tool provides answers for questions like, why do I need health insurance? How will I pay for health insurance? Will health insurance pay for my HIV medications? And can I still get services and help from the Ryan White program and ADAP? And on the right is another one of our consumer resources called Making the Most of Your Coverage. This one is designed for clients that have recently enrolled in health insurance. It goes over everything from how to use a health insurance card and contact an insurance provider to the basics of healthcare costs like premiums and out-of-pocket expenses. It also talks about where to go for care and how to prepare for a medical visit. And here are a couple more of our consumer resources. These ones are focused on staying covered throughout the year. The first one is called Staying Cover Stay Covered All Year Long, and it's designed for providers to share uh, with consumers to help them understand what they can do to maintain their coverage. So for example, it talks about paying premiums on time, reporting income and household changes, and what to do if someone loses coverage. And for clients who transition between coverage through the marketplace or Medicaid, Stay Covered All Year Long also includes information on what clients need to do to manage those changes. And the second tool shown here is our special enrollment periods fact sheet. This one's particularly timely. It provides information on special enrollment periods or SEPs that might help people to enroll in a new health plan or change their plan outside of open enrollment. So the fact sheet covers the most common SEPs and it's particularly uh, being used right now as lots of people are experiencing coverage gaps related to the COVID-19 pandemic. 
So Medicare is the largest source of federal funding for HIV AIDS care in the United States. And about a quarter of people with HIV who are in care right now get their coverage through Medicare. In fact, 46% of Ryan White clients were aged 50 years and older in 2018, and this is projected to rise to two thirds by 2030. So within the last year, the ACE TA Center has expanded our focus to help the Ryan White community get oriented to Medicare. So far, we've developed five resources and conducted a number of presentations to help Ryan White organizations learn more about Medicaid eligibility, enrollment, and coverage for people with HIV, and we're continuing to develop more. So um, we have three resources that have been posted for a couple of months now. The Basics of Medicare for Ryan White Clients covers eligibility pathways, different parts of Medicare, how to support Ryan White clients enrolling in Medicare, and how the Ryan White program can help with costs. The second one, Medicare Prescription Drug Coverage for Ryan White Clients, goes over Medicare prescription drug coverage for HIV medications, how the Ryan White program, including ADAP, can help clients pay for Medicare prescription drug coverage, and it talks about the donut hole period for prescription drug coverage. Um, and the third of these ones is called How Medicare Enrollment Works, and it goes over the different enrollment periods as well as how to avoid late enrollment penalties, how clients can transition from marketplace coverage to Medicare, and also how to make changes to Medicare coverage. And we've just released two more. These two are continuing sort of our focus on the basics. Transitioning from Marketplace to Medicare is designed to help providers work with clients to make sure they enroll in Medicare when they are first eligible during their first initial en enrollment period. That uh, really helps people to avoid late enrollment penalties. And our Medicare Parts Consumer Fact Sheet is a plain language resource to help consumers learn about the different parts of Medicare, parts A, B, C, and D, and how they make up original Medicare and Medicare Advantage. So I hope I've been able to give you a basic sense of what the ACTA Center has to offer. We have lots more resources posted on our Target HIV webpage, which you can find at targethiv.org ACE. So I hope you'll sign up for our email list there, get announcements about upcoming webinars and new tools as we release them. And please consider sharing our information with subrecipients, including frontline staff, so that they can benefit from our resources as well. I look forward to any questions people may have during the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mira. Great presentation. And if people aren't already on the ACE listserv, you should be there. <laughs> um, it's popular. Uh, so Luke, I think that's it.